Welcome to Grace Saskatoon. My name is Murray. Glad to be back after being away. And aren't you glad that things didn't end with where they did last week in, in John where the, the stone just rolled into place with a thud and it's just over. But it's not over because we get to turn the page and we hit John chapter 20 and that's what we get to do. And so this for me, I, I love the videos and I love the chance to worship God in song and praise. Um, but this is the most fun time for me. Whether I'm the one up here or whether somebody else is preaching it is when we get to open up the pages of this book and behold and hear the wonder of Jesus, the wonder of this good news story. And just to, to be able to pause and, and I don't know what your life and my life just gets too busy sometimes. And so to be able to take the time to sit back so we can actually meditate on the reality and truth that God shows us here. And so glad to be here. On my right, your left is Shelly. She's going to be interpreting in ASL. And so I have to remember not to get going too fast. And so I'll do my best. You can come tap me on the shoulder if I get going too fast, and then we'll try and slow down. But uh, we've got lots to cover, so we're going to get right at it. We're in John chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible, I think there's still a couple of Bibles left on the table. You can grab one of those. We want you to find the Gospel of John. Don't be confused with near the very end of the Bible, there's something called 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. That's letters written by the same author, but we want you to find the Gospel, the beginning of the New Testament. And so it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. And we're in John chapter 20, nearing the end of John's eyewitness account. And, and John chapter 20 really is a thrilling passage in which Jesus, um, after his resurrection, confronts those he loves. And just its foundational to the Christian faith really is the, the literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus and his promise to raise us up in physical, glorified bodies, not simply living in, in some spiritual place called heaven with disem, sort of disembodied spirits. That's more of a Gnostic idea. That's not a Christian idea. That's not a biblical idea. The very purpose of salvation is a resurrected people. It's the garden relationship with God in a new creation uh, on a renewed earth, now restored once again. Sinners brought again uh, back together with this God whose community is Kate. Caitlin uh, reminded us so eloquently in just uh, sharing kind of the vision of what we have for our gospel communities. But really to announce and authenticate his resurrection, Jesus appeared no less than 10 different times to as many as over 500 people, uh, according to the gospels. And so the resurrection is just crucial to us. Our faith depends on upon the testimony and the transformed lives of those who had actually seen the risen Christ. And that's why every Sunday really is a celebration of Jesus' resurrection for us, not just Easter. In fact, every day. It's changed everything. In fact, we're only here because Jesus rose from the dead. And he's alive today. And so my prayer for you today is that you might meet the resurrected Jesus today through his spirit, and he might change and resurrect your life. That is my hope. Now, a lot of people are skeptics. One such skeptic was Peter. He was a leader of one of the closest group of disciples of Jesus, and he had a lot of questions about what was true. In fact, he thought he had what he believed was true. He thought he had it all understood, but then Jesus was arrested and killed, and that's when just everything in Peter's world just came crashing down. Because Jesus was not supposed to die. Not in what he had believed, right? He was supposed to come and redeem. He was supposed to come and save Israel. So how could God let this happen? It's like everything that Jesus had promised that Peter had put his hope in, it's like it all got buried with Jesus in that tomb. And if Jesus was so loving, and if he was in control, and if he was who Peter thought he was, then, then why all this suffering? Why this mess? And so Peter's struggle of faith got so bad that he actually outright denied being a disciple of Jesus. He denied being a follower of his. But then everything changed for him one Sunday morning. So let's go back to the start of that day, John chapter 20, the first 10 verses. Reading from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. 
Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So when Jesus gave up his life to crucifixion, just none of his followers expected a resurrection. There was nobody standing outside the tomb going, 10, 9, 8, 7. Uh, they weren't there. They, that wasn't happening. And we saw last week, in fact, at the very end of chapter 19, there was two, two men, two well-positioned men. There was Joseph of Arimathea. There was Nicodemus. And they had wrapped the body of Jesus. So a group of women said, well, if two men did this wrapping, it's, he's probably going to need to be rewrapped. So, so after the Sabbath, on the third day, while it was still dark, so they headed for the tomb so that they could be there right at the crack of dawn. So on Sunday morning, they went to redo the work, or maybe it was just to add fresh ointment and spices. But this is why, really, the church began to gather on Sunday, because it's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, Sunday, you have to realize, in the Roman emperor in the empire was just simply a regular work day. It was the first day of the Roman work week. And so the church would have to gather either very early in the morning or else they would gather after work in the evening. So it was not convenient for the church to gather on that day, but they did because they didn't really care whether it was convenient or not. They cared about who they now were in Jesus together. And so they devoted themselves, the scripture tells us, to gathering together as the church around the scriptures to encourage and build up one another in the faith because they were in this together. And that's why we encourage you to arrive early, right? To connect, to minister to one another as Jesus commands us. Uh, to, and then we're here to welcome our guests and visitors. So those who come for 10, 15 a.m., we actually call our guests, and so welcome here. We love having you here. However, if you're a partner, if you're actually part of the Grace family um, and you're a believer in the resurrection, then help picture the resurrection by rising out of bed early, you fold up those bed clothes, right? And join us early. Mary Meglin, she rises up early in the dark on a work day to be with what she thought was going to be a dead Jesus. So how much more reason do you have to rise up and to journey here to be together with the risen Jesus and his resurrecting people? So verse 1, let's start unpacking the passage. Verse 1, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So here we've got the first day of the week, just like it was in the first creation, the beginning of the week. And so this first day now is signaling really the beginning of a new creation, a new creation being here. And John highlights this one individual, Mary Magdalene, because she is the spokesperson and she runs to the disciples and John is actually going to keep following Mary along as he continues with the story. And so that's why he focuses on her. But from the other gospel accounts, we also learn that there were several other women who also went to the tomb. And I know Bible critics, when they see things like that, they're quick to point out contradiction. See, the Bible's full of contradictions, right? But if this is propaganda, 
you would have a very cleaned up, glossy, everything well uh, collaborated version to make sure everything lined up neatly in one clean story. But the very fact that the different gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that they bring out various points of emphasis, that's what you'd expect to find if this was actual historical documents. In fact, that's what you'd expect to find if this is actual eyewitness testimony. So these women who are the first then to arrive at the tomb that Sunday morning, and, and besides, if you were going to fabricate a story, you wouldn't do it this way. Because historically, women in that day, they couldn't even testify in a court of law. Their testimony was not considered credible. And so it would only hurt your story if the first witnesses were women. And not only is Mary Magdalene a woman, she's one with a very bad reputation. So if you're going to fabricate a story, you don't want a former demon-possessed woman of the streets to be the first to the witness stand. It's not the way you would do it. In fact, you wouldn't have written this into the story if you were trying to write propaganda. It would only be there if you were simply being honest with what actually happened. Mary was there because she loved Jesus deeply. She had sinned grievously, and one who's been forgiven much loves much. Jesus tells us that. So we've got Mary, Mary Magdalene, and a few other women. They've arrived at where the, the tomb is, and they see the stone has been rolled away. And this is not to let Jesus out, we, we learn, but to actually let the witnesses in. Because you see, Mary's actually going there expecting to find a dead Jesus. And now everyone's gone. The soldiers who had been guarding the tomb, the, the temple guard, all of them that were there, they're now gone because the body's gone. And Mary then comes up. She sees that the stone has been rolled away. And so she runs in verse 2 then to find Peter and John, concluding that someone's taken the body. Verse 2, so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. So John, who's the eyewitness, who this account is, where we're reading of, he never refers to himself by name. I don't know if you've noticed that throughout our, our journey through John. He identifies himself always as the one whom Jesus loved. That was his identity. Now, he's not saying he's the only one Jesus loved. He's just emphasizing his amazement that Jesus actually loved him personally. In fact, his letter in 1 John chapter 4, he, in talking about the church, he, he makes sure that we know that Jesus calls us, the church, the loved ones of God, God's beloved. That should be the core of our identity. That's where you should find rest for your soul. So Mary runs to these two leaders of the disciples, and she says, notice though it's what, it, what John records, he says, we. Do you see it there? It's plural. John is consistent with the others. He's just emphasizing Mary as the spokesperson. She's the one who speaks on behalf of the other women who'd gone with her. And so she says, we, speaking for the other women, we do not know where they have laid him. So how did they respond to her news? Well, no wonder we don't allow you guys to testify in a court of law. You probably went to the wrong tomb. So Peter and John, they run to check, and they got to see this for themselves. Peter, the burly fisherman, young John, and off they run. And notice, it never even enters their minds that Jesus is risen. They just think someone must have stolen the body to desecrate it, just like uh, Mary suggested. So verse 3, so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. And both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I love the humanness of this record. <laughs> no other gospel writer records this, right? Only John, the other disciple. He wants this in the Bible, yeah? yeah. John says, I beat him to the tomb. You know, I outran him, you know? And he makes sure we know it because he repeats it in verse 8. Look it. Look down at verse 8. He says it again, right? He says, don't miss this. I reached the tomb first, right? You got to love the disciples, right? They're just as broken and messed up with ego issues as us. And that gives me such hope. Gives me such hope. Verse 5. So he reached the tomb. 
John gets there first, of course. Stooping to look in, he, that's John, saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. So though John got there first, right, he stops at the entrance, he's just sort of peering in there, but Peter, being Peter, he just muscles his way right past, he doesn't stop, and he just bursts right on into the tomb. That's, that's what we'd expect from Peter. Nobody expected a resurrection. Nobody. And then he, that's Peter, saw the linen cloth lying there, verse 7, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. Now, you need to picture what they saw. You've got, as we saw last week at the end of chapter 19, you've got 75 to 100 pounds of these anointed linen strips that have been wrapped around the cadaver. The face was not wrapped with these soaked uh, linen strips, but the face had been covered with a face cloth. In John chapter 11, in fact, in the raising of Lazarus, when it describes him as well, it also mentions that his face had been covered with a face cloth, so that was the, that was the way it was done. And so they would, they, would, they would wrap the body then with these linen drops, then they would dump ointment and spices, right, rub those in, then they would wrap again more linen, dump more ointment and spices designed to overpower the stench of decaying flesh. So you've got to picture this three-dimensional cast-like wrapping, kind of like a mummy then, like we'd picture a mummy, but with the face exposed so that the person could always be identified. So there'd be no switchy-switchy, right? There'd be no misidentification. You'd have that. So, but here we've got the face cloth we see in verse 7, and it's neatly folded, and it's set off to the side. I mean, what is this? This is the first miracle we see here. A single guy has folded his clothes. <laughs> Total evidence, Jesus is not a normal single guy. He must be God. He took time to fold the face cloth after rising from the dead. So it's like Jesus gets up, he passes through the mummy-like encasing around him, and then just la-di-da, la-di-da, folds up the face cloth. And the neatly folded face cloth then on this bench indicates a couple of things to Peter and to John. One, this wasn't a burglary. This wasn't a robbery because burglars don't take time to fold their cl- fold clothes after they steal things. Right? It's not like they break into your house and go, oh, here's a clothes basket. They must take it out of the dryer. They never folded this. Let's do this before we leave. That's not going to happen. So it was not a robbery. Second, a miracle has happened. Jesus' body has been resurrected. See, verse 9 tells us that their their whole worldview had no place for resurrection. It wasn't part of their belief system, but this changed all that. See, they they hadn't recognized that the scripture foretold this. It tells us that in verse 9. It wasn't until afterwards when they went back and reread the scriptures with new eyes, and all of a sudden it's like they saw the Bible for the first time as all about Jesus. And it wasn't the folded face cloth that convinced them, as amazing as that was. It was the fact that the now exposed face hole allows them to actually see inside those cast-like, mummy-like wrappings, and they can see the body's gone. And there's no way somebody pulled that body uh, or that somebody got out that face hole. That's why it says in verse 8, After affirming that he won the race with Peter, John says he saw and believed. He hadn't even witnessed Jesus alive yet. But the evidence he saw in that tomb absolutely convinced him. It forced him really to one conclusion. Now, back in verse 1, when it mentions that Mary saw the stone rolled away, It uses this, the normal Greek word for seeing. She saw something. It just means to see in the sense of data. It means data's hitting your retina, right? But here in verse 6, the word saw is a totally different Greek word. It's the Greek word theoreo, from which we get the word theorize, theorize. 
right? To reach a conclusion by seeing evidence. In other words, it's to say, I see, as in I understand. I understand because of evidence. And John also uses another interesting Greek word when he says, they saw the linen cloths lying there. And that word lying there, both in verse 5 when it refers to Peter, and in verse 6 in speaking of what John as well, it's a word meaning to stand up by themselves. In other words, it maintains the shape that the anointed strips had around that body as they dried. So that's why we said, picture a three-dimensional mummy-like encasing. And John uses the same Greek word than in other places to refer to once a vessel of wine that was standing up in a place. He uses it in another um, place referring to a throne standing up in a room. Or Matthew uses it to refer to a city that's set up on a hill. The linen strips then were not ripped apart. They weren't unwrapped. What they saw there was not just some sheet lying there, but the grave cloths, these strips then, were still round around, mummy-like, but empty. Maybe they're still a little soggy, sagging in a bit, but clearly through the face hole, they'd be able to see through that open face hole, there's no body in there. So that face hole was now open, the cloth set aside and folded, not to let a body out, but to let the disciples see in and believe, as you can see what it says of John at the end of verse 8. So faith begins in the mind when you receive the facts and you see with understanding. And then secondly, faith is personal. He saw and believed. In fact, literally, it says he believed into. And that's so awkward in English that, and in ASL, right? That for the most part, the translators, they don't put the into because it just, we don't talk that way. So it is saying John got it. He saw, he theorized and put this together and went, the conclusion was there. He got it, right? He put the pieces together and he believed into Jesus. Now, many believe in Jesus, but not into. Believing in Jesus is abstract, right? But believing into is personal. It's a personal giving of yourself to another. There are people who believe intellectually that the facts are true. But it's another thing altogether to believe into. To believe into is a love relationship of trust and dependence where you put your life in his hands, willfully and joyfully, whatever the cost. Now, I know there are people who, who here maybe even say, I believe in Jesus. Fine. But have you believed into him? The New Testament is filled with that phrase, the phrase of being in Christ, the, the phrase of being in union with him. He's taught the disciples in the upper room about you need to be a branch that's grafted into the vine. You have to be in this covenant relationship, believing in the whole of all that Jesus is. You have to believe him as, as prophet, where he tells us what's true. His word sits in judgment on us. We don't sit in judgment on his word. You have to believe in him as priest, where he alone is the one who can reconcile us to God. And as the priest, he himself becomes the sacrifice through which alone we can have forgiveness and find acceptance with God. And we believe in him as king, who's got every bit of authority. He's got all authority over every part of our lives. So believing into Jesus is believing into him as your prophet, as your priest, as your king. See, even the demons know and believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and at least they tremble. See, the trouble is for the demons and for many who say they believe is that they're still the master of their own lives. Believing into 
is a relationship term that connects you to the person of Jesus in glad surrender to him as Lord, where you now belong to him and you reorient your entire life around this union with Jesus. Because if Jesus is just just an add-on to your life, you might believe, but you've not believed into. The whole book of John, in fact, has been contrasting those who have believed in Jesus, right? Believed most often just to get something, right? Whether that's just to get bread for their belly, whether that's to get a healing. Uh, But Jesus, it says, does not commit himself to them. But only to those who believed into wanting Jesus, wanting and needing a relationship with Jesus himself, not just simply getting something from Jesus. And the exact Greek phrase is used in one of the most popular verses that John ever wrote in John 3.16, where it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, and literally it's the exact same phrase, whoever believes into him would not perish but have eternal life. And so the context, of course, of John 3 is this miraculous spiritual birth being put into a new family, into a new family, the family of God. Now, one of the reasons that I am a Jesus follower, why I am a Christian, is the transformation of those closest to Jesus after the resurrection, after what they personally witnessed. Because if you asked Peter, after he witnessed the crucifixion, Jesus dying on the cross and all that had happened, well, what do you believe now, Peter? Well, man, he was a powerful speaker, and man, he did things I can't explain. He did miraculous things. We thought he was, we thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was going to redeem Israel. But we were wrong. He's dead. We warned him not to go to Jerusalem, and now he's dead. What about you, John? Yeah, well, we believed he was the Messiah, but obviously he's not. He's dead. He isn't the Son of God. And Andrew and the others, they all believed they were wrong. And this is so unlike other religious leaders who, when they died, their followers said, we've got to keep this teaching alive. We need to keep this philosophy going forward. And they elevated the guy as a prophet, and then they determined to keep his teachings alive. This is true of virtually all religious leaders. doesn't matter if it would be Gandhi or, or Buddha or Muhammad or whoever. All but Jesus. Because Jesus built everything around himself. Who he was. God himself come in the flesh, come to pursue us in love. And then when he died... All his followers believed, well, and he couldn't have been who he claimed to be. So all his followers lost faith. Their hope was gone, right? Aren't you guys going to take his teaching, you know, and go out and take it to the world? Are you kidding? Everything he said was based on who he claimed to be, and he died. So he can't possibly be who he claimed to be. This is the end of the Jesus movement. And this is one of the reasons why I'm a Christian. Do you know why Christianity survived that first century and just grew and expanded and is worldwide today? Do you know why you should consider the Christian faith and follow Jesus? Because his closest followers all lost faith. That's their own testimony about themselves. And that's their testimony about each other. Nobody said, I knew all the time what was going on, I just didn't let on. Nobody said that. And then they saw something. Verse 10 tells us they went home. They went back to Galilee where they were told to go where Jesus would meet them. And there they encountered the risen Savior. And that changed everything. So we don't believe simply because the Bible says so. In fact, at the starting point of the Christian church, the New Testament didn't even exist. The Gospels weren't written down for about 20 years afterward. The New Testament wasn't collected and put together in the way that we know it as the New Testament until years after that. And yet thousands upon thousands became believers, followers of Jesus. And it wasn't because they read it in the Bible. It was because eyewitnesses were so extraordinarily convinced of what they saw, they were transformed. They totally changed their whole life. 
So the church wasn't launched because of a book or a teaching. The church was launched because of a resurrected Lord. And the doubting, unbelieving disciples who ran and came back and said, we saw him with our own eyes. Take our lives if you want. We saw our Lord Jesus risen from the dead and he has sent us. And even if you kill us, we have absolute certainty we'll be raised from the dead in him. We'll get our bodies back. We're going to get our believing loved ones back. We're going to get this world back, only it's going to be a lot better. We've seen Jesus manifest his absolute authority and rise from the dead. This is the confidence we have of, of our forgiveness and our resurrection by him when he comes back. So the fundamental question you have to wrestle with is, who is Jesus? A single event changed how those closest to him answered that question. They had a pre-resurrection answer and a post-resurrection answer. They saw and touched Jesus, risen from the dead. And they saw the wounds in his beautiful glorified body. Now why in the world would Jesus, in his beautiful glorified risen body, still have those wounds? I mean, wouldn't you want to get rid of them? I mean, that's why you use makeup, right? You're covering up the blemishes, covering up the scars. But no, those scars testify and will testify forever that it is finished. It's finished. His substitutionary atonement on the cross, dying in our place, has been accepted by God the Father for our justification, for our acceptance with God. God is satisfied with Jesus' offering, are you? And those scars are going to testify and remind me forever that the only reason I have a shared life with God, that I have eternal life with him, is Jesus. And what he did for me in the cross that will ever tell the story of amazing grace. Peter walked into that tomb a discouraged, defeated doubter. But he walked out as a faithful, lay-down-his-life leader in the Christian movement. Now, some of you may have questions, and, and there are some things in your thinking maybe that don't add up. Maybe like Peter, you feel Jesus disappointed you, or, or maybe like Peter, you feel you've disappointed him. Maybe disappointed him to the point you feel your relationship's beyond repair. Peter knew that tomb was empty. And even to this day, that fact is almost entirely agreed upon. However, not everyone agrees or believes that Jesus rose bodily from the, from the grave. The question really up for debate is, how did that tomb get empty? Did someone steal the body? Well, we know that Pilate, he gave permission then to the, the Sanhedrin, that the, the Jews set up their guard, and they, he gave them a, a squadron of Roman soldiers, 16 soldiers, and they stood guard around the clock. Pilate ordered the, an official Roman seal on that tomb as well uh, to be placed there, which meant that anyone who disturbed that seal did so on the pain of death. So even if one soldier fell asleep, the whole garrison was to be executed. When the body went missing, we're told that the Sanhedrin actually paid off the soldiers to say they fell asleep. And that while they were sleeping, all 16 of them, along with the, the temple guard, well, they were all, had all fallen asleep, and then the disciples came and stole the body. Now, how they'd know the disciples did that or who stole the body if they were all sleeping mm, is, a, is a question for them for another time, but... The Sanhedrin then dealt with Pilate, we're told, also, because they had him, remember, um, in such a way with fear over the emperor, so they uh, set it up so he wouldn't uh, do anything to the soldiers. They didn't even receive any discipline. But the, to me, the very fact that Jesus' enemies established a story that the body was stolen by his disciples affirms something. It affirms with historical certainty that the tomb was empty. Because there's no reason for the Jews or the, or the Romans, all right, to make this story up unless the body was actually gone. You don't have to make it up that someone stole the body unless the body's missing, unless the tomb was actually empty and they hadn't done it. In fact, if the Jews could have produced the body, they most certainly would have just to shut down the claims of resurrection. 
So when I consider, too, the disciples pulling off some Ocean Elevens like heist, stealing the body, that's about as far-fetched as you can get if you know the disciples, right? That conspiracy theory, yeah, is written by somebody who does not know the disciples at all. But the most obvious and compelling explanation based on all the facts is that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Jesus resurrected. He appeared to the disciples. He commissioned them to take the message of his death and resurrection to the world as good news. Even though it cost them everything. They lost everything, including their lives. But they suffered gladly. Why? Because they had seen the risen Jesus with their own eyes. And they had touched and handled him So if the evidence is so overwhelming, why is it not readily accepted? Well, let me answer in the words of a German philosopher, Wolfhard Pannenberg. He said, and translated into English, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so strong that nobody would question it except for two things. First, it's a very unusual event. And second, if you believe it happened, you have to change the way you live. People say, it's impossible for somebody to rise from the dead. No one's ever done that. And that's the point. That is the point, right? Because if people typically rose from the dead, this would signify nothing. But it's the fact that this is a unique, one-time event of an impossible, miraculous nature, then that reveals Jesus would be who he claimed to be. And if it's true... That means he's Lord over morality, salvation, history, and over everything in your life. The reason most won't accept the resurrection of Jesus is not because of the evidence on its own terms, but because there's another reason, apart from the evidence, and they've already made up their mind. To say there could be no resurrection is to say there's no God. But to be wrong about that has eternal consequences. For Peter and John, they reached certain conclusions from the empty tomb and the empty linen grave cloths. One is that Jesus actually was who he said he was. His rising from the dead trumps my opinions, trumps yours. It trumps your PhD author whose arguments you've decided to trust into. I think Peter and John still had a lot of questions. But knowing Jesus rose from the dead just trumped them. You see, they they couldn't unsee him. And you may have doubts and questions. I'm sure Peter and John had plenty. But if you were the first one to have gone into that empty tomb and you saw through that face hole, that mummy encasing that it was empty, would you be willing to rethink your objections? Maybe even if you still had some unanswered questions, you'd know Jesus was who he claimed to be. See, faith occurs not when you have all your questions answered, but when the unexplainable confronts the undeniable. See, you think you have some questions that are unexplainable? Well, the resurrection is a miracle that's undeniable. The second implication for them was their past no longer defined them. Remember, Peter in particular, he'd blown it. He felt like his relationship with Jesus was so damaged that it was beyond repair. But here's what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. I love that. Born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Many people believe that God's acceptance of them is based on how good they are. And that may seem to work for you until you fail big time like Peter did, right? Then you start wondering, well, how good is good enough? But the resurrection is God's declaration that he's accepted Jesus' payment on our behalf. In the resurrection, he declared Jesus' payment was sufficient. And now Jesus, still with his scars, stands alive testifying to that. And he has created, united us now to a new family. So Peter says, 
we have a living hope kept in heaven for us. And that hope has a name. It's Jesus. And thirdly, their future was secure. Peter says, through the resurrection, we now have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, right? It's kept by God's power. He goes on to say, everything in this world spoils, perishes, and fades. Johnny Erickson Tata, if you don't know who that is, she was a girl at age 17, a diving accident, ended up being a quadriplegic. She's now 69 years of age, just turned 69, I think, on mid-October here. And she said this, the first thing I'm going to do in the resurrection with my new legs, I'm going to drop to glorified knees and worship Jesus who saved me. You know who talks like that? Someone who's believed into. Into. And then she says, and then I'm going to do a backflip. <laughs> right? And that's because of the hope of resurrection. The resurrection, it's the starting point of our faith. The resurrection of Jesus and it's the end point of our reality, our resurrection. And that means you have to respond. You can't just say, well, okay, that makes sense, and then go on living your own way. If Jesus is the life, and if he rose from the dead, then we need to listen to what he has to say about everything and submit to him, and obey him, and believe into him by recognizing and receiving him as the Lord he is. So we don't want you to simply believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus, but to see and to believe into, into a relationship with Jesus, our living hope. Though it may cost you everything that this world has to offer. The stolen body theory just doesn't hold a lot of water for me. And it dries up completely when you actually take a look at what happens next. And that's the physical appearances of the risen Lord, which we're going to look at next week.